I'm Andrew, and this is NPMC's Top 5 of the Week. What's up, church family? I hope you're doing well, but more importantly, I hope that you're staying safe and healthy. You may have been getting calls from your deacons just checking in on you. We also wanted to let you know that if you guys need anything, please call Pastor Dave, Pastor Matt, Elena, or myself. We are here for you. After this morning's top five of the week, Pastor Matt and the team, hooray, will be leading us in some worship. So make sure you sing loud. Yeah, I shouldn't be on the team. That was awful. But after that, Pastor Dave will be preaching from the Word of God, and he will be in 2 Timothy. So make sure to have your Bibles or smart devices ready. Now, here's your top five of the week. The church office is open Tuesday through Friday. So if you have prayer requests or anything that you need, please call during church office hours. Prayer is a very important part of our lives right now, as life is kind of crazy for you and for me. So don't be afraid to reach out. I am Zooming on Mondays and Thursdays at 7 o'clock, and I want you to Zoom with me too. It's our time of prayer and encouragement, and I know over the last couple that we've done, I have been encouraged. So if you've been a part of it, thank you. And if you have not yet, I encourage you to do so. And you don't have to worry, because I don't put you on the spot. I won't ask you to pray that moment. I'm not Pastor Matt. I like to give people ample time to prepare. So what I'm doing is I'm calling people ahead of time and asking them to one, read some scripture, and to pray. And it's really not that hard. If you have any questions about any of it, how to set up the Zoom or the meeting ID or password, call the church office. I hope that I see you on our next Zoom call. The primary elections have been postponed until June 2nd. NPMC will not be a voting center for this election. We will this fall for the presidential election. Starting May 26th, you can vote absentee if you don't feel comfortable voting. Go to indianavoter.com if you have any other questions. Over the past several weeks, I have told you that Caleb and Charity Froby are expecting their first child. The baby is due in two days, that's May 26th, and we need to bless this family with tons of diapers and tons of wipes. So what are you waiting for? Their address is in the directory, feel free to drop them off on their front porch, like what are you waiting for? Let's go bless this family. If you have any questions, contact Carol Smith. Today is a day where we get to celebrate our graduates. So after Pastor Matt and the team lead us in worship, we have a short video with some photos. And I'm sure you guys are gonna be going, ah, but that's okay. At two o'clock today, we're gonna be celebrating and starting with the car parade. So this is your chance where you get to drive past the grads and either say hello or wave or yell congratulations or you decorate your car, go all out, put stuff everywhere. I vote that one. I'm excited to see some decorated cars. But if you do need help decorating your car, come at 145 and I or someone on our team will help you decorate our cars. Let's celebrate these grads. If you have any questions about any of the announcements that I had mentioned, please call the church office. Hello, New Paris Missionary Church. Thanks for watching NPMC's Top 5 of the Week. Have a great day and be blessed. Well, good morning, church family. Glad you're all here with us this morning. I hope you're ready to sing. Uh, we've got some good songs lined up, like this morning. A few weeks ago, we started out with a hymn. Guess what, Gail? Yeah. It's like you're with us when we're singing hymns. Yeah, yeah. And this morning, we're singing There's Power in the Blood, so I hope you're ready to sing with us. Sing out loud, and let's believe that there really is power in the blood. So let's sing this out. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would 
wonderful power in the blood of the Lamb. And this morning, I just wanted to read you a passage of Scripture as we continue to worship. And it's found in Psalm 105, verses 1 through 4. And this is what it says. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell of all His wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And I hope that's what you're doing in the midst of all that's been going on, seeking his face every single day. And as we continue to sing, let's lift up our praise and just proclaim the love of Jesus. Let's sing this. Praise is rising. Eyes are Turn to
and in your presence all our fears are washed away because when we see you we find strength to face the day every day lord and in your presence all our fears are washed away they're washed away Welcome him into our lives and in every aspect. And we're going to lift up the name of Jesus together. So let's sing this out as a family of God and lift up his goodness this morning. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name oh yes I will sing for joy heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against oh yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name
the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to save But your name is a strong and mighty tower Your name is a shelter like no other Your name, let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to save but your name. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Bless your name, oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes, I will for all my days, oh yes, I will for all my days, oh yes, I will God, it's because of your amazing grace that we're forgiven, that we can lift your name above every other name. And our chains are gone. We've been set free. And God, you are our Savior. You've paid the ransom so that we may praise you with all of our hearts. And that's why we can say that in the lowest valley, we're going to lift your name. And as believers, that's why we can sing this song to you of your amazing grace grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was blind but now I see it was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour I first Lift it up. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending. my 
Thank you for your amazing grace. The fact that our chains are gone because we've been set free by you is something that we should not and do not take for granted. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have each week and every day of our lives to be able to worship you with all of our hearts. And God, help us to not grow tired of the fact that we can come to you, that we can lay our burdens down at your feet, and we can just worship you with all that we have and all that we are. God, you've promised good to us. You are our anchor, the one that we can always turn to. And God, as Pastor Dave comes to open your word, give him boldness, help him to... Speak to each one of our hearts through your Holy Spirit and help us to be able to hear the things that you would want us to hear this morning. And God, above everything else, in the midst of everything else going on, God, as we, as we celebrate our graduates today, God, may you bless them. We know that you have a plan for each one of them. And I just pray that you would help them to walk in step with your Spirit so that they would know the things that you would have for them. God, thank you again for this time. And God, we look to you now. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ that everyone prayed. Amen. So now there's going to be some pictures of our graduates. We're going to be able to see them when they were little teeny tiny babies. They're so cute. I put the video together so I already know what it looks like. But they're so cute. (sighs) But I hope you enjoy the video. And then after that, Pastor Dave's going to come and open the word. So you can be prepared for that. He'll be in 2 Timothy. So check this video out. And then let's open the word together.
Well, good morning. We're glad that you're here today. I hope that you have your Bibles. I'd like to ask if you have them with you right now to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's where we're going to be at today. But before we go there, we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament and read through Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 to 27, just to kind of give you an example this morning of where we're going to be going in these next few weeks. We're going to talk a lot about what we do with the Scripture. How do we handle the Scripture? What's the value that we should place on Scripture? In a time in which churches find themselves arguing and struggling over all different sorts of different things, like the style of music that we have, or, or the design of our sanctuary, or the lighting of our sanctuary, all those things that come into play that people struggle with, it's a personal thing, it's a, it's a traditional thing. I, I want to share with you today that in the next few weeks, what we're going to look at is the value that we place on the Scripture how we handle it or how we disregard it when it comes to preaching and teaching, how important that this topic is in these next few weeks for all of us. I want to just ask you now, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to Proverbs 4. We're going to begin with verse 1, and let me read it to you right now. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of righteousness is like the morning sun shining ever brighter to the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. And we're going to move from there, from Proverbs chapter 4 to the New Testament and look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. And as we do, let's bow our heads for a word of quick prayer. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we come to you, Father, we're so grateful for the word of God that instructs us, that gives us wisdom, that gives us guidance for our lives, both spiritually and physically. Lord, we're thankful for, for the way that you guard it and you give it to us and you provided it for us, Lord, to use in every aspect of our lives, not just what we do on Sunday morning, but, Lord, what we do every single day of our lives. Lord, I, I pray this morning as we begin to look at the value, the validity of the Scripture. Lord, help us to never stray. Help us, Lord, to always be confident in it and trust it, Lord, for everything that we need, every moment, every day of our lives, and we will always remember to give you the praise, to give you the glory, Father, for who you are. And Father, it's in your precious and wonderful name, the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, now reading from our text this morning, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're beginning with verse 14. Paul says this to young Timothy, he says, But as for you, he says, continue in what you have learned 
and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So this morning as we begin our time, I just want to share with you this phrase that keeps coming up over and over again that Paul speaks. And the first time I remember ever hearing these words, keep on, was from a homiletics class that I was taking at Bethel College. And it just so happens at the time that our senior pastor here at MPMC, John Moran, was actually teaching that class. And every time he would grade one of our papers, and by the way, if you don't know what homiletics is, it's just a class that helps you to understand how to structure messages and how to preach. And every time that he would grade your paper, oftentimes he would just give you a word of thought as he, as he records the grade. And I remember he wrote down on my paper, just two words, and I wasn't even sure what he meant by it. He, he had put my grade there, and then at the very end, he, he had written down there, keep on. And I thought to myself, did he mean that I needed to do more? Did he mean that I, I, I didn't give enough? Did he mean that I needed to keep digging? I wasn't sure exactly what he meant. And as we were talking about it, he had said to me, Dave, of all the things that you will ever do when it comes to preaching the word of God, the thing that you need to make sure that you, that you focus on the most. And man, my ears perked up. And he looked at me and he said, Dave, keep on in the word of God. Don't stray from it. And as I heard those words, they were reminders to me every day of my life in ministry that the commitment that I have to have to the word, part of what is so crucial is for me to keep on with the word, not to stray from it. Well, I found out later on that those words were not just unique or, or profound from, from Pastor John, but it was words that Paul had written. In fact, we, we see this when Paul was speaking to uh, the, the Jewish Christians in the synagogue as he was beginning to pro proclaim to them the word of God. They said, come back next time. Come back and teach us again. And in Acts chapter 13, he says to them as, as he's leaving, he says, continue on in the grace of of God. Well, he doesn't just say it to them in Acts, but then later on as he's speaking to the Colossians in, in chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, he says, but look, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And then he says this, look at verse 23, if you continue in your faith. <laughs> It's so important that the course that Paul was giving to Timothy, the, the last swan song that he, he's about to present to Timothy is simply these words, Timothy, of all the things that you're going to need to understand, you got to keep on. And so these words were not just true for, for Pastor John. They weren't just true for Paul, but they were true for Solomon too. And we just read those words from Proverbs chapter 4. But we could have gone to many of the different Proverbs and heard the exact same thing. For example... We could have looked at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 17, where he says, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Or, all, but continue, or you could say it in the, in the translation of the King James, continue on in the fear of God. It's, 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 a, it's a directional thing. It's something that you're committed to. So that's really what Paul's saying to here to young Timothy. He says they're going to be evil men, and they're going to surround you. And they're going, to do, they're going to go from bad to worse in what they do. But don't be envious of them. And you might say to yourself, well, why would Timothy be envious of people who are going from bad to worse? Well, the reality of it is, is that in them doing so, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be very intrigued by them. They're going to be liked and people are going to flock to them because the message that they have is a, is a different message. And their, their tickling ears want to hear. And it's an easy message for them to follow. And, and I think in some ways, perhaps Paul's thinking about the question that maybe young Timothy might be asking to Paul. And I just wrote this down. And, and, you know, of course, you can write this down in your notes if you want. But I imagine that Paul anticipated that young Timothy would look at Paul and say, but Paul, what am I supposed to do? You're leaving what am I supposed to do in light of the fact that you've talked about this persecution thing? In light of the fact that there are these people in Ephesus that have invaded and, and there are these evil teachers and these imposters. So Paul, what do you want me to do? I think those are, are clear things that Timothy would consider or at least think about. I mean, I think Timothy would understand the fact that, that this thing's not going to be a walk in the park. And it's not going to be easy. And, 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 and he's made that, Paul has made that so very clear over these last few uh, months that we've been talking about this. 
And of course, I think that Paul, anticipating that, begins to say to young Timothy, which you and I have seen over the course of the last few weeks, he's, he's let him know what he's supposed to do. If you were to ask anyone after reading uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, what, what would one do? What do you do in spite of that? What do you do in, in light of those things occurring around us? Well, he tells Timothy. He says things like this. He says, don't engage in unnecessary conflict. It's not, it's not worth going around just picking a fight. He says, don't be a quarrelsome pastor. Show gentleness, he says. Show gentleness to those who oppose you. And I got to tell you, as a pastor, it's so good to hear that I'm not the only one who gets opposed, that I'm in good company. But those who he says who has a form of godliness, he says, not just those who oppose you, but those who pretend to be something that they're not, that they have a masquerade, that they, they wear a mask, and they have, a, they have this, this, this form of godliness, but deny its power. He says, don't spend time with those people. In fact, he says in verse 5, he says, have absolutely nothing to do with those people. And the reality of it is, you and I know as some parents that we teach our children all the time. He said, you become like those that you hang with. And so he says to young Timothy, don't hang with those people because they'll distract you, they'll maneuver you, they'll change you. You don't have to look around, brothers and sisters in Christ, you don't have to look around very far in the church today to see examples of those very examples of people who, who started off, who started off even well and fell apart. In fact, you could look around and you would see people who, who heard the advice of Paul who had not continued on. People who had not, who had not learned how to stay focused and were distracted, sometimes even destroyed despite a very good beginning in their ministry. And this all happened as a result of, of a failure. A failure to continue on in the word of God, to, to trust the word of God for what it is. And it seemed clear that, that to these people that we find in verse 13 of chapter 3 that have moved on. They've moved on away from the sound teaching. In fact, they've moved on in such a different direction, opposite to the sound teaching. They have, they have done it in such a way that they've moved from a pattern of sound teaching to a pattern of their own style of teaching. It's almost like they, they, they made the wrong turn on I-65 and they're making really good time, but all of a sudden they realize they're going south and they should have been going north. And yet, even though they were making good time, they were making good time in the wrong direction. It, it wasn't worth their time. It wasn't worth their, their, their motivation to, to keep the course, to keep the momentum. And here, here Paul's saying to them, they're traveling so fast. But they're going in the opposite direction. And if you think about it, you can almost imagine the temptation that there would have been. Here Timothy's looking around and there are these people in Ephesus and they're, and they're devouring people and people are gravitating to them. And it almost might be like in some ways Timothy would look around and he would think to himself, wow, maybe I just need, need to be more innovative. Maybe the message needs to change a little bit because they seem to be flocking to these people. Maybe I need to be more aggressive. Maybe I don't need to be the fuddy-duddy in the room, the one who just keeps on talking about the same thing over and over and over again. And I mean... <laughs> Who wants to be known as that? Who wants to be known as just sticking with it? You know, that's really what Paul's saying to Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, stick with it. Don't give up on it. Keep going the right direction. Don't waver. Don't turn around. But when all this fun stuff is happening all around, do you imagine how easy it would be for Timothy to just sway just a little bit? And the problem was, the, the greatest problem of it all was, that everything that they were doing was at the expense or at the replacement of the gospel message. It wasn't too long ago. I ran out of shaving cream, and I'm pretty cheap, so I've always asked my wife to buy, I won't name the brand, I'll just tell you it's a white foam that I get, and I, don't, I can't really tell the difference between that and any other shaving cream. And plus, it's really cheap. And I've tried other things, and, and they're okay, but there's really not, to me, much difference in that than the other. And one day, my wife came in. I didn't know what she had bought, but she would got me some shaving cream. And she said, honey, I've got you some shaving cream, and I think you're going to like it because it's new and improved. And all of a sudden, oh, I don't really want the new and improved. I really want the same stuff I've always had. And then she showed me the can. I thought, oh, yeah, it's my brand. But she said, it's, it's new. It's improved. It has a great smell, and it's good for moisturizing your face. And I thought, wow, that looks good. And I wonder how many times have we said to ourselves, nah, I don't want the new and improved. I want the old stuff. 
And you know, I think that's exactly what was happening with young Timothy. And I think that's what Paul was trying to explain to young Timothy. For most people, they want the new and improved. And I wonder how many times that my shaving cream was, was brought up to say, this is the new and improved of this. And Timothy's dealing with that from a spiritual standpoint. He's, hear, he's hearing these messages from these people say, wait a minute, quit listening to Timothy. He just speaks about the same thing over and over and over again, but we've got something new and you're gonna wanna hear about it. And now these people, they've hit Ephesus and they have a new and improved morality. They, they, don't, they don't believe in the old stuff anymore. In fact, you know that whole premarital sex thing? Forget about it, we made it easy for you. New theology, it's a little quirky, it's a little weird, but you're gonna like it. We made it really easy for everybody to follow. Trust me, it's terrific. We've gotten rid of all the old stuff. It's all gone. And the problem is, and the sad part about it was, is there was a market for this because there were people who were flocking to that message over and over again. And now relate that to us today. There are people who are flocking and flocking to this new message, something that's made easy. We don't have to talk about the cross anymore. We don't have to talk about the blood anymore. We don't have to talk about surrender. We don't have to talk about being a servant of Jesus Christ. We want to make this about us. And people flock to that. And there was a big market then, and there's a big market today. And then, then as you jump to chapter 4, let me just jump, jump ahead for just a moment. In chapter 4, Paul goes on to speak about, hey, don't lose sight of the sound doctrine, because for here's what you're going to find out. In verse 3 of chapter 4, he says, for the time will come. And it is so very true. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine anymore. Timothy, they're not going to want to hear it. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather them a, a, them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. It's going to be easy to find people who are more than willing to, to compromise and to belittle and make light of the word of God. And so Paul says, you have two problems that you're going to have to face, two problems that you're going to have to confront. And here they are. You have these people who are really appealing. People like them. People like to listen to them talk. And oh, by the way, they, these people, they're, they're, they've got a message that people want to hear too. Not just are they cool people that speak really well, but they like the message that they're hearing. And he looks at them, Timothy and he says, you need to understand something. These two things are going to be a problem, but if you stick with the program, you won't get your picture put on People Magazine. No, you, you're going to find yourself being the person who people are saying, oh, Timothy just says that all the time. So Timothy, he says, this is my instruction to you. And here it is, and I want you to write this down. Number one, keep on in the faith. Keep on in the message. And don't disregard it. Don't, don't maneuver it to be say something that you want it to say. Let it be what it is. Because if it matters to Timothy, if it matters to his salvation, it's going to matter to the salvation of those that he teaches. He says, Timothy, this is no small thing. It's not just a personal preference. It's a matter of your salvation. It's a matter of the salvation that, of the people that you teach this to. So the directive is clear. He says, don't be like those folks. Don't be like those who, who walk away from sound teaching. Don't be like those imposters. He says in chapter 3, verse 14, he says, but as for you, Timothy... Continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. That's where we're going to spend most of our time for the rest of this morning. He says, unlike, unlike those who always are learning but never becoming those who learn knowledge or the truth, like the women who are, are just gulped up by those who deceive them, those people who creep into homes to devour them. He says, Timothy, he's had the knowledge of the truth. Timothy, he's been saved, and his convictions have been settled. He doesn't have to worry about that now. But young Timothy, you're going to have to stay the course. You're going to have to remember that, that this is not going to be an easy teaching, but it's going to be valuable to you. And I can almost imagine as Timothy receives this letter from Paul, and I want to take a little liberty this morning. I can imagine when Paul uh, sends this letter to young Timothy, and Timothy begins to read it. I imagine he comes to, to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, which at that time it wasn't broken up like that. But beginning with verse 8, I can imagine him stopping and, and him beginning to read this to all those who were around him, all those who were listening to his preaching. 
I can imagine him just saying it out loud in these words. So do not be ashamed, in verse 8. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And then I think verse 9, it's almost like a summary of the entire gospel message. And he says these words. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. I imagine that, that Timothy could just make the whole gospel out of this one passage right here. He has saved us. What did Jesus do? He died on the cross for us, and he's called us to a holy life, not just to accept the cross and not do anything different, but we are to be changed, not, not because of our works, not because of anything that we've done, but because of the grace that is found in Jesus Christ. And this grace was given, not through many, but from one, the person of Jesus Christ. So for Timothy, he had, he had settled these matters by a saving knowledge of Jesus. Paul's not writing to a, a professional pastor. He's not just writing to a really good speaker or a gifted speaker. Paul's writing to a, a son in the faith. He's writing to Timothy and he says, on, on what you have learned, he says, all these things, hold the line. Because Timothy, it's about the content. It's about the message. And it doesn't mean that you can't illustrate it differently. It doesn't mean that Timothy you can't tell a joke and he can't use props. It doesn't mean that. It just means don't change the narrative. Don't change the content. Keep the content the same. Because there's going to be people who are going to want to change all that, Timothy. They're going to want to change the gospel, Timothy. It won't be about the grace of Christ anymore. It won't be about the cross anymore. It's going to be about other things. It's about what is easy for me and what's pointing to me and, and selfish to me. Timothy, you're going to have to hold the line. And Paul says, and I want to tell you why. I want to tell you why that you keep on doing what you're doing. And he says it in those two verses. He says, because you know your teachers. That's number one. Number two. Timothy, you know the scriptures. And that's what he says in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Timothy, this is not just a message that's confused you. You're convinced of it. But also because you know those from whom you learned it. And it's clear that in Timothy's young adult life that he's learned so much of that from Paul. In fact, you could almost go through 2 Timothy and you could just read over and over and over again where, where Paul describes that it was teaching that he gave to Timothy. Look at verse, one, uh, verse 13 in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. It says, What you have heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people. Timothy was a son in the faith. Paul was his primary teacher, his primary instructor, but it wasn't just in his teaching. See, that's the one thing that we all sometimes miss out on, that it's not just about what we teach. It is the core of it, but it's not just that. Because Paul didn't just teach him, but he also showed it by an example. By the way that he lived his life, in fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, he says that you, however, Timothy, know all about my teaching. You know about that. But here's the thing also that you need to understand. You also understand my way of life. You know my purpose and my faith and my patience and my love and my endurance. And this is important. Because as much as a pastor could ever do, standing behind a pulpit and preach a message, it is for not if the, if the character doesn't match up with the word. That what you do outside of the pulpit matters because if you can't follow what you're teaching, then it just destroys the entire message. If the integrity has not been there, it would have undermined Paul's ministry as a whole. So let me say to you, anyone can talk. Anyone can do that. But to trust the test is how you live out your life. And for young Timothy as an adult, he had, he had Paul. But Timothy also had a grandma and a mom who taught him about the saving knowledge of God and his fearing him and knowing him in a personal way. He was taught as a young child to fear God. And I have to tell you that here's the problem that I think that we have in our culture today. I remember sitting in Pastor John's office one day and he was talking about a conversation that he had had with a parishioner. 
and the parishioner was talking about their kids, and they said, Pastor John had mentioned, hey, you know, we'd like for your kids, you know, to come and join us for Sunday school. And they said, no, no, no. No, we don't do that. We don't force our kids to go to Sunday school. We don't, we don't, we don't push Christianity on our kids. But they were coming to church. No, no, we, our kids come if they want to come. Our kids go to Sunday school if they want to go. <laughs> and he said, that doesn't seem right. He says, no, we are going to wait until they grow up. And then they can decide for themselves whatever direction that they want to take. <laughs> and they can sometimes, they can someday make a choice. And I can't help but think, as, Paul, as, as Pastor John was speaking about that story, I, I kept going back to what we are just reading right now. In Proverbs chapter 4, as the father is saying to his son, seek wisdom, seek wisdom, keep on, don't let it stray from you. Keep, keep going down the path that, that leads us to light, but don't go down the path of darkness. What are we doing when we say to our kids, we're not going to teach you, we're not going to tell you what to believe, we're not going to tell you to go to Sunday school class, because you'll figure it all out someday. But here's the problem. you got to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 18, and you can say that to, to Abraham. Yeah, even to Abraham, God said that, about how important it is that you teach your kids. In fact, this is what it says in Genesis 18, verse 17. He says, Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, and here it is, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. <laughs> I mean, you see, the way of the wicked is death. And he says, and you've got you to make sure that you lead your children in a way that leads them to Christ, to lead them to the Lord. And then they will stumble in darkness because of what they do not know. And I think about how many people in our church look around and say, well, you know what, my kids really don't get into this. They can do whatever they want. But then you got to go and go a little further in Exodus chapter 10. And then you have Moses. And in verse 1 it says, But then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them. And here it is, verse 2 that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them and that you may know that I am the Lord. To teach your kids to know that I am God, I am the creator, and I'm the one who saves. Hey, let me tell you, Moses, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Abraham, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Christian parents, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. And let me also say, it does not matter how good your teachers are. It does not matter about the facility or how good a facility is that you send your kids to. The buck begins and it stops with you. That you're to teach them. And Paul said, from birth, Timothy, you've been taught these things. Timothy had the sacred writings. And Paul points to the source. He says, you know the word of God and you know those who taught you the word of God and be convinced in those things. From a child, he had known the word of God. He is from his grandma Lois to his mother Eunice. So Paul says, don't reject the teaching that has been given to you, young Timothy. What a blessing. Can I just stop there real quick to say, what a blessing it is if you've been raised in a Christian home to have that kind of guidance, that kind of teaching in your life. And if you're a parent who's, who's looking at your young kids and you're thinking, I don't feel adequate, I just want you to know that God gives you the power, he gives you the wisdom, and he gives you the, ins the, 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 the ability to trust him to lead your kids. And he'll help you through the, leading through the word, and he'll help you leading in your example. And it's not just a suggestion, it's a command. So what a blessing it is to, to be raised in a God-fearing home. So number one, keep on in the faith. And here's the second point today, and that's this. You, Timothy, you know the scripture. And you might say, Timothy, what scripture do you know? And Timothy would say, I know the Old Testament. And in fact, in verse 16, what we're going to refer back to later on is that he is, he, Paul says that all scripture is useful. And, and he's not just talking about just the Old Testament. Paul said, but what, Timothy, you're hearing from me will be part of the whole package. It'll be a part of the whole word of God. The apostolic teaching will be part of the New Testament that will be combined with that, that will be the fulfillment of the Old Testament. 
And I can imagine that, but for here's Timothy, and he says, but you know what, from up to verse 15, I never heard of the gospel of Matthew. I never heard about the book of Acts. But I have the sacred writings. And I think Timothy would find it very easy to sing that beautiful song that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You might say, but wait, wait, how could Timothy know that? How, what Bible would he know about Jesus and how he loves me? Through the sacred writings, the Old Testament. See, Timothy could have, would have learned those things. He would have learned that God is love. And you might say, wait a minute, you mean that you understand a generic kind of love, right? No, Timothy would say, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And you would say, wait a minute, Timothy, that's not the Old Testament. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And I think Timothy would say, and if you give me a little liberty this morning, let me just say, I think that Timothy would say, no, no, I understood about God's love because I remember those mornings, I remember those nights that I would sit down with my mom and my grandma and I would ask them, Grandma, tell me that story about Abraham again. Tell me that story about Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 when he, when he took his son Isaac and he went to the mountain and he took the two servants and he said to the two servants, stay here, me and the lad are gonna go to the top of the mountain and we're gonna worship God. And, and young Isaac would look at the father. He says, Father, we've got the wood, we've got the rope, and we've got all the things for the fire that we need. But here's the one problem that we got. Where's the sacrifice? <laughs> and Timothy would recall this as he would think about this provision that God was going to make for a sacrifice, pointing to something that was to come. And then he might say to his mom, Mom, tell me that story from Isaiah again about that figure that is led to slaughter, that, that, that lamb that is led to slaughter, that figure. What is that about? And then maybe young Timothy would have recalled later on when he met Paul. And Paul would point him to John the Baptist and he would recall those words of John the Baptist that said, Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And for young Timothy, it was in those moments that he experienced all the goodness and the love. And all those pieces come together for young Timothy. He says, I understood about the grace and the love of God. <laughs> that, he, that God is love. Not because that we first loved him, but because he gave his son for us. There was a point into that promise long, long ago in Abraham. And then later on in Isaiah. And now we see it taking place in the person of Jesus Christ right here right before their very eyes. <laughs> and I think about how many people in our church really believe that. <laughs> how many people in our church really have become convinced of what they've heard? Or do they come to church and they simply look around and they say, well, you know what, I don't believe everything, but I'm here. And I can just say to you this morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's just not enough. You, you can't just say, I believe that Jesus is real. You've got to believe what Jesus is in your life, what he has done for you. And you've got to accept it and to acknowledge it and to, and to repent. It's not enough just to say, well, I don't know if I believe or not, so I guess I'm on the fence, and I guess some way, somehow, I'll be okay in the end. It's not enough. <laughs> you know, right now, we're living in a time where there's not a lot of people flying and things like that. But I have to <laughs> think about how this relates so much to so many people who are in our pews every single week. My wife and I, often when we go to Florida, we fly out of South Bend Airport. And, and it, it's become kind of a habit that we, we know exactly which gate to go to. We go to gate nine. And that, that takes us directly to Punta Gorda. And from there, we go to Fort Myers. And it's so, I'm always so anxious to go. And sometimes I sit and I look out this big window and I look at all these planes that are other, at, at other gates and they're so much bigger, and I think, you know, wow, that's a pretty big plane. That might be nicer than the plane that we're going on, because normally the planes that we're on are pretty small. And I start thinking about that, and I think, you know, until, I'm not convinced that I'm going to Florida by just sitting there at gate nine. I'm not convinced that I'm going to go to Florida just because I've got a ticket. I have to be convinced once I get on the plane. I have to, I have to acknowledge, and I have to be on that plane. I have to take precedent of that. I have to take ownership of that. I've got to step onto the plane and be fully convinced of where I'm going. I can't just sit in the chair and say, well, I think that this is a good place. I think that I've got it. I've got to get on the plane. 
I have got to be willing to step out and say, I trust it. And for young Timothy, what he needed to do was to simply look and say, I'm not just going to sit around and, and say, well, some of it's good and some of it's not, or that looks better than the stuff I've got, but here's what I need to know. I've got to be willing to get on the plane. I've got to be willing to acknowledge the fact that here I am, and I have, I, I've got my destination right where I need to be, and the way that I get there is I've got to get on the plane. And some of you this morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, I think you've got to get on the plane. For some of you, you've been sitting on the sidelines for a long time and you haven't been willing to walk up that ramp and to get on that plane and say, I have committed to it. Once I'm on this plane, I'm here until it lands and I know exactly where I'm going. And you gotta know how to get there. And I pray that he is your pilot. I hope that he's not a passenger in your life. And I'd like to ask you this morning to do me a favor to, to commit to something, if you would. To commit to to praying for your pastors, to pray for me, to pray that, that we would not be uh, distracted by a new fad or a new something that comes along, that we would not find ourselves walking away and, and, and being prompted to, to come up with another message, to come up with a, another gospel, to pray for those young pastors who are coming up behind us, who are going to be those who are going to be teaching their congregations, that they would stay committed to the word of God, that they would not d detract from it and walk away from it, but trust that even when all these ears want to hear something else, but you stay the course. I just ask you this morning, brothers and sisters, to pray. Pray those words that we would not fall for those new fads, but we would stay committed to the scripture, to the word of God that leads us to light, not into the darkness. I pray that the time will come that might, like myself and many others, that we would love to tell the story. What's the story? In that beautiful song that's given to us, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, it will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I pray this morning, brothers and sisters, that, that you love to tell that story. The story that is so old but so true so life-changing and so, so sweet to the touch, to the thought of what it means to know that it points to Jesus who gives you hope and gives you life that's beyond this world. Yes, there will be others who are going to get their pictures on People Magazine, but because you have stayed the course, because you've trusted him, you, your children, your family, your neighbors have a chance to experience the goodness of who Jesus is. I pray that in these days that you're taking that time to do just that, to be a teacher of this beautiful message that is for us, to know him, to experience him in a fresh, in a new way. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, we just come to you now with such grateful hearts. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, that, that we don't have to come up with a new gospel, that we don't have to come up with a, a new way of thinking about theology, that, Lord, it's right here for us. And it doesn't change, but it does change us. It has the ability to speak to us about every single area of our lives, regardless of what we're doing or where we're doing it. Lord, the message is true. I pray, Lord, that in those moments of temptation, that, Lord, that we would we, we would hunger to maybe change it just a little bit so everybody could get in. Lord, we want everybody, but Lord, we, we want to lead them to Christ, not to a lie, and most certainly not to hell. Father, I pray that you would guide us as pastors and as teachers. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to fall in love with that, that, that beautiful, beautiful story of Jesus and his love. And Lord, may we be convinced of it because of what we've been taught and who we have been taught by. Father, we love you today. And Lord, it is in your precious and in your wonderful name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week and be blessed.